Welcome to Rough Drafts, how God writes his love in our stories, a podcast that explores the faith journeys of our friends and neighbors in Burns, Tennessee. Everyone has a story to tell. And in this podcast, we'll hear powerful and inspiring stories of how God works in the ordinary lives of people like you and me. Our stories are unfinished and perfectly imperfect. They are just rough drafts, a glimpse of what is to come because God is still at work, writing plot twists, introducing new characters, and bringing good even from the most challenging circumstances. Join us as we see what God is up to in our stories. Here's your host, Matthew Hyatt. There is no one like today's Rough Draft podcast guest. He has been a friend of mine basically since the first Sunday I walked into this church. Uh, You can see him at work. You can see him at a football game. I love knowing how often he is just doing good things. Uh, Today's guest is somebody who whenever I see his name on the caller ID or his truck pull into the parking spot outside the office, I'm just happy. And he's a person that radiates joy. And that's not because life has always been easy. Today, you get to hear from my friend, Randy Fuquay. Randy, welcome. And thank you. Thanks for having me today. So to prepare for this podcast, we had Mexican. Right. And that felt like the right way to start this, didn't it? <laughs> yeah. It did. It did. It's the warm-up round. I might go to sleep now. So you said you've heard a few of these podcasts. I have. Is there anything you need to say as a rebuttal to Mike's episode? <laughs> No, he done better than I figured. He was oh. he, he stayed more church like than I figured he would. <laughs> he done good. He yeah. done good. Mike's special guy to me. How long have you been been at this church? We've st- been a little over twenty one years. Twenty one years. Come here in two thousand two. And you've lived in Burns <clears throat> your whole life. No. No. I lived in I grew up in Dixon. Okay. And Jenny and my wife has lived here her whole life, and we've lived in Burns for the last 44 years since we've been married. So, And you've been at your job for 42 years. 42 years. I'm not much on change. No, you're not. It's like no. been the same house for over 40 years. Same yeah, job. For lunch each day? That almost. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Same woman cuts my hair for the last 40 years. <laughs> well, and you kiss the same girl goodnight every day. That's too. right. That's right. How many years have you all been married? 44. 44. 44, 42. That's pretty cool. Mm-hmm. Randy, you've got a lot of stories, so I have no clue where you're going to start. But my question is, what's your dot story? Well, as a kid growing up, we were we went to the Baptist church, and uh, we didn't go regular. We, uh, we didn't, we might go three times one month and one time the next month, and, but I'll just be honest with you and tell you that the thing that probably kept my mom and dad out of the Baptist church the most is every Sunday we go, that coming Thursday night, they would have visitation night or whatever, and the deacons would come over and and not act like they were glad you came Sunday, but want you to join and more or less putting pressure on us. I remember it as a child, actually, and that actually was a turn off to my whole family. And uh, probably actually kept us out of the church a lot. You know, it's funny. I don't think people understand what a fine line you walk when you're trying to help help people with church stuff. Mm-hmm. Because if you come to church and I don't ever talk to you, you're going to go home and say, well, I don't care about you. But if I show up at your house uninvited, you're going to say, this guy's pressuring me. And trying to find that happy middle ground is not something churches have excelled at over the years. Right. Well, this place has done an awesome job of it because when we come here, we felt absolutely no pressure. We felt that everybody loved us from day one. And that's what, uh, you know, when me and Jenny first got married 44 years ago, we uh, we didn't go to church for a long time. And uh, May Chandler, my sister-in-law, she came here probably 30 years or more ago, and she was always a good example of knowing somebody close in her family went to church. And yeah. uh, then Mike got to go in, and they were, they were the main reason we come to church here today. They invited us one Easter back in 2002, and we've been coming practically every Sunday since. So, you know, so uh, you said if that church can put up with Mike Chandler, it can put up with me. That that's actually about what I was thinking. <laughs> <laughs> I only said it because I thought you had said that before to me. So, but you know, they they were a huge, huge part of us 
starting to come here and a huge part of my Christian life. Yeah. And uh, me and Jenny got, we started dating in 1978 and got married in 1979. So uh, she was just 19 years old and I was fixing to turn 21. So we have not only grew up together, we've grown old together. And uh, me and her might have been like you and Leslie. Uh, I think I was definitely in love before she was. <laughs> she worked at a place in the Dixon Plaza called the Chocolate Shop her senior year in high school. And it was a little pizza and ice cream place. And I had a good friend that her parents run the place. And I met Jenny there. And I was in love with her from the first day I seen her and have been ever since. So did she take some convincing? She did. <laughs> <laughs> she did. I finally wore her down. Well, you know, patience is a virtue. That's right. That's right. I was persistent, if nothing else. Oh, I can relate. So, uh, but we have, um, you know, we... have so Mike was busy with the kids, and Jenny had been raised kind of in church like I had. They had been to church quite a bit. Her mom and dad and grandparents were went to the uh, Primitive Baptist right up the highway here, yeah. and we went to it a few times and stuff, but they, they kind of moved around. They just met up there actually one Sunday a month. They went to different churches. They were so small, but... We started coming here, and uh, we have, I've loved it and loved all the people here ever since. And like I said, they never never put any pressure on us about anything. Yeah. You know, they just made you feel wanted and made you feel loved and was just glad you was coming. So That's really special. They've done an awesome job. I started doing things like helping with the Lord's Supper and stuff pretty soon after we started but it was a good long while before I ever taught a class I actually went to uh the teenage I had never to be honest with you a lot of people may not know this but I was 43 years old when we started coming to church here and I had never been to Sunday school or Wednesday night class in my life yeah so this is the only place I'd ever learned about the Bible and so you may be thinking now, hmm, maybe we hadn't done that great a job. He don't know. <laughs> no, no, but, no, you no. know, uh, y'all have taught me everything. The teachers and all the elders and deacons and teachers we've had have taught me so much. Well, you're one of the best teachers we have. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't. I'll tell you a little story about that. One Wednesday night, I was in the auditorium. I'd been coming here six or seven years, and I'd helped with the teenage group when quarter and Glenn Buffington was teaching the class that night he asked me when we was leaving that Wednesday night he said hey Randy we're gonna be out of town next week how would you like to teach the auditorium class adult class next Wednesday night I'd never taught the adult class nothing you yeah. know and uh you know how I am I have a hard time saying no sometimes <laughs> so I told him I would Walking out to the truck at night, I'm thinking, huh, wonder what Glenn was thinking. What in the world was he thinking asking me to teach next week's class? Well, by the time I got my truck was driving home, I was thinking, huh, what was you thinking telling him you <laughs> would teach next week's class? Yeah. So, uh, but I got through it, and my big problem with teaching that I've had the hardest time dealing with with teaching is I feel like Every adult in that class I've ever been in with knew more about the Bible than I did. No, no, no. And uh, that made me, I don't know, either have to study harder or something. I don't know exactly. I did have to study hard, though, because it didn't, it didn't come natural for me like a lot of people had learned it all their life. Well, your hard work was always evident, and that's one of the reasons your classes have been so... So popular when you've taught is because mm -hmm. people could tell, you know, you didn't just show up and repeat something you'd heard, you know, you you dug in. Mm -hmm. and people can tell when it's a, a fresh dug meal versus something that's stale. <laughs> that's it's true. Different. That's true. Okay, so do you remember the time um, we asked you to teach from the Kyle Eidelman book, Gods at War? Do you remember this story? No, I don't yeah. think I do. Hey, it was you and um, Charlie Dawson. Char okay, I did not know I what there's the a third one in that. Class. I did not know. What, I could not remember the subject. But, but I, I remember uh, I handed you the book, and you said something to the effect of, 
huh, it's about idolatry. Finally, you're asking me to teach about something I don't struggle with. I know exactly what you're talking about now. Okay, do you remember where this mm-hmm. goes next? What'd you say? Well, I did get to, uh, well, I did find out that I had a lot of idols and didn't know it. I idled everything that was in the book. I do remember that uh, Charlie would do the main teaching one Sunday, and I would get the second part, and he'd get the third, and so yeah. on. And I was glad to find out when it, it was Charlie's time to teach when it come down to talking about sex. So I do remember telling that... Uh, Charlie would have a sex talk, and I thought he might have a film the next Sunday. <laughs> and the look on Glenn Buffington's face when I said that, I thought, well, this is my last Sunday to be teaching. And Charlie just got so tickled, and was he would giggle and kind of wheeze while he giggled. <laughs> <laughs> he would call me every Saturday night and talk about what we was going to talk about that next morning. Me and him had an awesome time. You know, we need to get Charlie on this show. We'll do a phone thing and get him to, yeah, he, to do this, because he got some stories. Oh, yeah, he does. He does. You was talking about Mike a while ago. Mike and I were door greeters one Sunday. And and for that period of time, visitors stopped coming to church. <laughs> <laughs> you probably saw attendance was down. But Charlie come by and asked how everything was going. I just happened to have eight or ten quarters in my pocket that morning. I told Charlie, I said, I'm getting a quarter apiece for these bulletins. And he just shook his head, turned around, and walked off, never said a word. <laughs> That's Charlie. Yeah. Uh, good old but Charlie. that was funny. Well, Randy, you uh, you have walked through some tough things. Um, and I was hoping today that maybe you could share a little bit about what it was like to walk through some of those things kind of uh, for people who are listening who, who might not know Braxton's story, your family's story. I, I would love to hear that story. Well, you know, uh, Braxton was our second grandchild, and uh, he, uh, at the time, my son Kyle and Braxton's mom were not together, so Kyle was living with us about after Braxton was probably 18 months old, so uh, me and and Kyle has been a firefighter most of his life, and uh, he would be working 24-hour shifts a lot. So when he wasn't off from work, and when he was at work, Jenny and I would have Braxton for 24 hours at the time. So yeah. if we went out to eat, went to a movie, whatever, Braxton just went with it. He was almost like a kid instead of a grandchild Yeah, because we were just with him so much, and uh Got super close at the time. We just had two grandsons, Christian and Braxton, and uh, we were very close to them because that's all we had at the time. Now we have seven, and uh, they're spread out a little more, what we get to do with all of them. But at the time, with them living with us every other weekend and every other week during the summer and on holidays, we just got super, super close to him. And Braxton was really a, a special little kid. And uh, I always tell people that I think God made him so special because he knew he wasn't going to be here long. And uh, we were, you know, life went on. And uh, Braxton one day started complaining of having a headache some. And uh, his mom one day at school, the teacher complained about having him saying he had a headache. And his mom carried him to the doctor and he told, the doctor told her, said, hey, I really don't believe anything's wrong, but we will send him to Vanderbilt to get a scan just for a peace of mind more or less. And then when we find out he's got a brain tumor and he hadn't, and when they took it out and sent it off, he, it was brain cancer, medulloblastoma. And he went to St. Jude for... Off and on for a year, he stayed there seven whole months without coming home while he had chemo. When he was having radiation, he would have a week of radiation and come home for the weekend and then go back and stuff. But they lived in a an apartment that St. Jude had for him in Memphis there. And, uh, you know, we made many a trip down there and see him and stuff and, uh, he lost a bunch of weight, lost his hair, the whole deal, and you know. And then he uh, he got better. He got where he didn't have cancer at the time, right before Christmas that year. 
That was a wonderful Christmas. It was. He he went 11 months down there, and then right at Christmas, he got to come home. And uh, then Christmas, of course, on December 25th, on, he woke up one day from taking a nap in January and told his dad and them his fingers were numb. So, of course, it scared him to death, and he ended up going back to the doctor and to the one year to the day that he found out he had a brain tumor, one year to the day after that, he found out he had a new tumor in his spine, and they give him four to six weeks to live. And he ended up living about four months. Yeah. And we were grateful that for that four months because we got to uh, spend some awesome time with him. He had several days. He actually felt pretty good. And uh, we went fishing and he even got to play ball. He loved baseball, and he got to play with his team. Six months before he found out he had cancer, his all-star team and six-year-old all-stars won the state championship in East Tennessee, and he just loved baseball. And, you know, I've, I struggled with him having cancer. I struggled spiritually with him having cancer i struggled with him dying and uh it was the first time i'd ever got on my knees and begged god for something begged him to take me and let him live and that just wasn't god's plan but god did answer my prayers he don't have cancer anymore he's in heaven and i truly truly believe that i'll get to Spend the eternity in heaven with him. So uh, we had a, I, I don't know how I could have took going through that whole experience without God. Now, sometimes me and him wasn't on the same page. <laughs> you wrestled a little bit? I did. I did. I can remember one night in particular when he had had his feeding tube put in his stomach. It was probably just a month and a half, two months in to him having cancer and we were down in Memphis, and he got to go home from, at the time, he was taking radiation, and he got to go home to the um, Ronald McDonald house at the time. That's where they were staying. And I can remember him loading him up in a van in a wheelchair, and it was raining and thundering and dark. It was done nighttime, and we carried him over there, and I had to park in the back of the Ronald McDonald house, and watching uh at the time seven year old just turned seven year old at the time watching a couple of guys unload your grandson out of a van in a wheelchair when he's hurting and sick and got cancer uh it wasn't easy to take and i remember i went and parked our car and jenny and his mom went on in the ronald mcdonald house with him and it was raining, and I remember looking up at the sky and asking God, where was he? But uh, he was there. He was there. I was the one that might have took a step back, but he was there. And matter of fact, we found out he was there on the way home because uh, we went home at night, and the weather was awful. It was storming that night, and... Jenny had pulled up right over on her phone. It was going to be like that all the way out. I drive. And I can remember me saying, we're down here in this flat part of West Tennessee, the way our luck's going. We'll have a tornado come off, come across the interstate and take us away. And Jenny's only remark to that was, nah, that won't happen. We're not that lucky. Because <laughs> we kind of felt sorry for ourselves at the time, you know. Yeah. And, um, uh, but, you know, we realized on the way home, we kind of had some peace of coming home in the storm at night, and God got us home. And I can remember being at work the next morning, texting his mom pretty early to see how he was feeling, him feeling better. And I just, it was just kind of a way that seemed like to me, God let me know that, hey, I am there, and I am watching over y'all. So we had a lot of stories like that. So I love the way that you looked for and found found those stories because it would be really easy for me not to well it 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 was easy and i'd be lying to you now if i told you i still didn't have them days when i 
missing. Yeah, I've n- I was very, very close to my mom and dad. I was a mama's boy growing up, <laughs> and even after I was grown. And I miss my mom after she passed away, and I miss my dad. But I, n- I have never lost anybody that I physically, physically hurt, like being sick after and still some days of losing Braxton. So it, you know, when sometimes you do, and like I said, I look, Braxton, one day we didn't get to go down on a Saturday, one Saturday, and we had FaceTimed him, and he was at their apartment. And we had talked a while, and he, he loved, he felt fall of our house is his second home. Yeah. And he asked, how was his outside? Because he loved being outside. So I remember walking around the yard that day with the phone, showing him the field, the yard, everything. Just And now, most times when I get through mowing and weed eating and things out in the yard now, I tell him, hey, Braxton, still trying to take care of you outside the best I can, you know. So it, it it's been hard, but it it's it just changed our life. I don't Kyle, my son and his wife, they uh it's changed their life, but they've got more kids that they gotta they gotta get it. You they know, they survive. gotta yeah, they gotta raise them and they gotta you know, they're constantly doing. But me and Jenny being old enough we're home by ourselves, we had a lot of time to waller in it. And I'm not sure that's always good. You know, sometimes we chose to wallow in it. And, uh, but sometimes wallowing, it's all you can do for a while, mm, you know? I think sometimes people are almost like, cheer up, get over it. Mm, and that's not helpful or healthy or realistic. Well, I remember about a year after he passed away, my primary care doctor, his nurse, lost the eight-year-old, maybe she might have been 10 by the time she died. Mallory's Miracle, you remember Mallory Guthrie? The, yeah. Her mom is my a nurse to my doctor, and I asked her one day at the hospital, I said, how long is it before you quit feeling like we're failing? She said, I can't tell you because I'm still there. You know, so... It's going to be something we carry around with us for the rest of our life. It just is. I mean, they're not very few hours out of the day goes by. I don't think something about him or something remind me of him or bring up a memory or, you know. But my main memory is being so thankful that Jesus got on that cross and died for me and him so we can be together one day. Yeah. One of the hardest things I saw you do was do that funeral. Now, I haven't been to a whole lot of funerals that played ludicrous. That was new. <laughs> uh, My first. Uh, all I do is win, right? What, what, what yeah, the song? Yeah. But it was just perfect. Mm. And I, I hope that the other guy never hears this, but there was a preacher up there who who preached part of the funeral. Uh, but he was entirely irrelevant mm. because you got up there and you you shared you shared the stories. You you told the truth, and you were. It was one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen happen in a church. Time. Well, I appreciate that. That right there was a uh, should make anybody realize they're a God because I couldn't have done that without God. Yeah. And I've actually wondered since then how I did get up there because I can cry coming home from work getting to think about him. But uh, the only thing about that whole funeral, the things I said that I've been disappointed in is one of the things I said is that I hoped I didn't let, that this didn't let anybody go down in their faith in God or their faith, you know, and I've let it affect me some. Yeah. I mean, you know, for a fact, I don't come to church quite as much as I used to, and I can't tell you why. Well, the preaching here is bad. That's one reason. <laughs> so, you know, we can let you off the hook there. <laughs> but, um, you know, I've struggled with it. I still struggle with it every day. I mean, I just do. And um, it, it's just something I'm going to have to work through myself. And uh, I'm not mad at God, you know, 
I have been a time or two yeah. over all this. But, uh, you know, another thing I look at, too, God watched his son suffer and die. And he could have stopped it and didn't. And, of course, I couldn't have stopped it. So he knows what it's like. He knows what I'm going through, and he understands, I think. So, uh, you know, hopefully I, my story, hopefully it'll help somebody in the future. You know, we're, that's my hope. So in this process, what what was helpful to you? Uh, was there anything you did, anything anyone did for you? It, what What helped? I can tell you exactly what hap- helped the most about this church during the whole thing. We got meals brought to us, and hey, that was awesome because we'd come in from the hospital or come in from St. Jude or come in, you know, and have meals. They even carried meals to call them. And people prayed for us, people texted us, people sent cards, people done everything they could. Yeah. But the thing that stuck out to me the most is the people here felt the same pain we did. You know, they didn't try to say, hey, it's going to be okay, or, you know, you're going to get over this. You're going. They just... They knew we was hurting, and they didn't try to, they didn't try to sugarcoat it or make it any lighter or any better. They just hurt with you, and that meant a lot, my whole lot. Yeah, that's the definition of compassion to, mm-hmm. to suffer with someone, mm-hmm. not not to stand on the outside of it and look down, but yeah. to be in with. And you know, that's that's honesty, that's vulnerability, that stuff that's that's tough because. Mm-hmm. Nobody likes to hurt, so it's really easy to mm-hmm. to stay just outside of it, I think. You know, I've told you the story of I thought we met Jesus one day. The Chick-fil-A story. The Chick-fil-A Tell story. Tell that story. You know, we all went in between Braxton's um, radiation and chemo. We went to Gulf Shores for a few days because he loved the beach. He loved the beach. This is the last time he was ever at the beach. And... uh we stopped on the other side of Birmingham, Alabama, the Chick Fil A on a Saturday afternoon, and me and Jenny sat at a different table because they had a table full and it was busy and stuff. And I, as soon as I sit down, I noticed this older gentleman that was dressed about like I do when I'm at work. He had on blue jeans and old t-shirt, and he didn't look like he had a whole lot. And he was just drinking a Coke or tea, or he just had a drink. I didn't see any food. And I'm sitting there thinking, you know, whew, you ought to get up and ask this man if he wants something to eat. And he ain't minded done eight and just been sitting there relaxing. I I don't know and we'll never know. Right. But he just, he was sitting there and I noticed him looking at Braxton. It was easy to tell he was a cancer patient. He was thin. He was pale. He didn't have any hair. And at the time, he had a feeding tube wearing a backpack on his back and a feeding tube going into his stomach so I knew the man knew you know Braxton was sick and before we I I just kept sitting there thinking you know y'all to go over and say something but you know you never know yeah so but as longer we sit there my feelings toward what I was thinking about that man changed something was something was different about him never spoke to him or anything uh but Right before we left, Braxton got sick. And uh, when we were leaving, he asked Braxton, he said, you okay, little man? And Braxton told him, yes, sir, and we left. And when we was walking out the door, I looked back at him, and I just threw my hand up to him, and he waved back. Yeah. And last time I ever seen him. I wish I'd have went over there and hugged him, but I didn't. I yeah. just waved at him. And... uh we got in the car and I asked Jenny, I said, you know this old man? And it was kind of, now I'm calling him an old man. He probably wasn't much older than I am. <laughs> but I was, and she said, well, I'd seen him, but she said I heard him ask Braxton, was he okay? But I had my back to him and I didn't notice him that much. And Matthew was kind of weird. The rest of the way to Gulf Shores, we still had another four hours of driving. I just felt really peaceful driving. We didn't have the radio on. Jenny and I were just riding together, and it was just a peaceful ride the rest of the way down there. Well, me and Kyle went after we got down there that night and went to get some groceries, and 
coming back, I asked Kyle, I said, hey, did you notice uh, that old man sitting at uh, Chick-fil-A over there by himself? Immediately, tears started coming out of Kyle's eyes. He said, yeah, he said, I thought that was Jesus. <laughs> and I said, yeah, me too, you know. And uh, Kyle, I didn't, after we got back and put up groceries, I didn't talk to him the rest of the night, really. And then Sunday morning, we were sitting out, and I, Kyle said, hey, guess what? I said, what's that? He said, I asked Stephanie, his wife, he said, I asked her, uh, he said, did you know this old man sitting there at Chick-fil-A yesterday afternoon? And she said, yeah, I thought that was Jesus sitting over, <laughs> you know, so... It's kind of weird that three people in a row had the same thought. But a sense of peace and presence. Mm -hmm. And that's, mm -hmm. I mean, the Bible talks about peace that passes understanding. Right. This is not something that, I don't have logical boxes for you, but right. you all experience mm -hmm. the same thing. And that's pretty special. Mm -hmm. It is. I think sometimes we think God only shows up in in the Old Testament or in burning bushes or lightning bolts. Right. But, I'm, you know, Hebrews talks about entertaining angels unaware. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I just wonder, maybe. Yeah, you don't, you don't know. I can remember James Hinkle telling us that uh, he's had many people come up and say, when I get to heaven, I'm going to ask God, why this happened, why this happened? And I hope. I have the same feeling when I get to heaven one day that James said he thought it'd be like. James said that uh, he didn't think you'd be able to ask any God anything because uh, it's going to be so awesome when we get to heaven yeah. that uh, you're going to forget everything that ever happened to you on earth. The other stuff just becomes trivial and doesn't matter anymore. Well, let me change gears on you a little bit. All right. One of the things that you have done uh, with this church for a whole lot of years is you have been the guy who has taken people communion. Uh, you know, who couldn't be with us. You know, we take communion every week and communion. We don't think it's magical. You know, we don't think you go to hell without a dose of communion. Right. It doesn't keep the devil away for seven days, but it's special to us. So we like to do that. And you've had a lot of experiences delivering communion to people, sometimes for their first time or sometimes for their very last time and sometimes both in the same day. Uh, share a little about that. I've had a lot of interesting times. I, I have been, I have give communion for the last time to a few people. And uh, one of the ones that I think of the most is Mr. Lynn Estes. I remember giving it to him uh, on a Sunday and he died later that week. And he really was, he was at the nursing home and he wasn't that sick. I mean, he was sick, but I, did, I sure didn't know it was gonna be his last one. Right. The biggest thing I remembered about that day, he had just, he got his hair cut that week. That's all I remembered about this. Day. And he had it just burred. And I'd ask him who cut his hair. And he told me, he said, you want me to get him cut your hair? And I said, no. I was trying to find <laughs> no, out who to avoid. <laughs> yeah, no, I don't. <laughs> and uh, Bill Larkins, Miss Jean's husband, he, he asked me one Sunday, I know you probably wouldn't think it, but I had on a tie one Sunday. What? <laughs> you? Yeah, really? And... Uh, he asked me where I got my tie when I carried communion to their house. And I said, I don't know, fuzzles or somewhere wine. And he said, well, it's got a big bow in it. And I, I didn't even realize what he was talking about at first, but he's talking about him coming over my stuff. You know? <laughs> so, you know, he was always a cut up. And I can remember in a pouring out rain one Sunday afternoon, Karen, when they lived over on 47, Adam and Sarah Jude communion, and they were sick with the flu. And they stood inside the door, and I stood out on the front porch and give them communion, prayed with them from the front porch. See, that was good practice for what would happen during COVID. <laughs> yeah, it was. It was. But I enjoyed that. I I enjoy getting the, especially some of the older people, I, I enjoy getting to go to their house. I've, I've actually carried communion to Mike and May and enjoyed, you know, getting to have communion with your family, you know, and stuff. So it is. That's really cool. Mm -hmm. um, you're a person who has chosen joy. You are a happy person, even though you have been through some stuff that's not so fun. How did you end up who you are? <laughs> I don't know. One, I'll tell you a little story. My grandmother 
when she passed away, I asked Jenny one night, I said, you know, my grandmother was an awesome person. And after she had passed away, I told Jenny, I said, you know, uh, my mom was just like my grandmother. And I told Jenny, I said, you know, my mom was there to take my grandmother's place when she died of, you know, just being who she was. And I said, I don't know who's going to take my mom's place when she dies. And Jenny said, well, you're just like her. <laughs> and uh, I didn't tell Jenny that night, but that was probably the nicest thing she'd ever said to me. Because <laughs> if you didn't know my mom, that was definitely a compliment, you know. And uh, so my mom had a lot to do with it. My mom, my dad was a great person, but my mom, she cooked in the school system while we was, me and my sister were growing up, and she, uh, she washed, cooked, she had breakfast for us every morning, supper every night, and war I never, ever heard my mom complain about being tired, I wish I didn't have to cook supper, I wish I didn't have to do this, yeah, or that, and my mom, the Bible says that, uh, Everybody sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Yeah. My mom must sin before I was born because <laughs> I never seen it, you know. So uh, she was, she's probably a whole lot of reason I am. And, and Jenny, me and Jenny's had a, we've had a good marriage. We've grown up, not only grown up together, but we've grown old together now. She is so good. And, uh, you know, We've even got closer since Braxton's passed away, I think, because we know what each other goes through every day. Yeah. And, uh, you know, all the ups and downs I've had in life, that I can't think of anybody in the world I've ever been with than, than Jenny. You know, she's she's took me as I am every day, and uh, she's been awesome for me. And we've had two great kids, and we got some great grand, you know, the grandkids are awesome. And, yeah. And they love her to death, and they love me, but they love her to death. <laughs> they do. Well, they she's do. just so good. We got one granddaughter, and she, she, uh, she worships the ground Jenny walks on. <laughs> she FaceTimes her at night just to talk to her, oh. you know, and just lives five miles up the road. So, well, hey, you do what you got to do to get some. Of that, that's right. A good Jenny in your life, so. And then we're blessed with an awesome daughter and son-in-law. Matter of fact, you've married both my kids. So. That's true. And uh, I still <laughs> I don't know that I'd realized that until you said that out loud. I know, but you have. So you've been an uh, awesome person in my life. I know. Now. God has blessed us to get to do some some cool stuff and some hard stuff together. Mm -hmm. You know, you and I have shared some funerals and mm -hmm. some weddings and baptisms and communions. And, yeah. You know, you're just... Um, I love the way that God uses Randy. And even during COVID, I remember, you know, we were doing all the video stuff and that's, that was just awkward. Um, I still feel weird about having a podcast with my name on it. That feels real <laughs> wrong. You know, mom always uh, growing up would say fool's names and monkey's faces off appear in public places. <laughs> really? So, you know, yeah, good. <laughs> when, you, like when you got your name on a podcast or a video on the internet, you know, you'd, I always felt like, uh, that when we recorded those videos during COVID, it was it was halfway between like uh, one of the prosperity gospel televangelists asking people to send in their money and yeah. a Taliban beheading video. <laughs> so you know, <laughs> yeah, it was different. Yeah, you know, but you um, you know, I was feeling real weird about that one day, and you came to the office just to tell me about watching the church service with a guy at work. You know, yeah, a guy I worked worse. with, he got to watching them, and he had been through some hard times in his life, and I think he. I think he's still what he's retired now, but I think he's still watches our service. So, so cool. you know, uh, it's kind of weird the way God does use you. The like I said, I was forty three when I become a Christian, and my life actually the first forty three years was pretty, as Jerry Seinfeld used to say, pretty even, Stephen. You know, things. Something bad happened, something good happened, take its place. And a lot of the worst things in my life have happened for sure. Losing my parents, Jenny losing her parents, uh, us losing the grandson, just getting older. Just lots of things have happened. 
since we've been going to church. Yeah. You know, that I've had a hard time dealing with without God and without church. And they're not an elder or a deacon here or a member here that I don't think I could go to and talk to something about if I had somebody, something bothering me, yeah. you know, just like John Gabriel and I went to a ball game together Friday night. You know, I could go to John with anything. I've come to you with some things I'd hated to come with somebody to somebody else with, you yeah. know. So how would you say your faith has changed over the course of your life? Whew. I, you know, the more I've learned, the more, the more I just believe there is a God. I mean, I just believe, I, just that I feel stronger about that God is there. The, of a morning when I'm going to church, they're about a, when I'm going to church, when I'm going to work, they're about a month before I get to see the sunrise. Mm -hmm. And at the top of the hill, it burns in between Barnes Elementary and Barnes Middle School. And if, if you could see out of a morning and the fog in the valleys and the clouds and the red sky, you know there's a God. Yeah. I mean, there's nothing that just all of a sudden that's there for no reason. And the older I get, the more I realize what Jesus done on that cross means to me, that I have no hope, no way to heaven without him. And just what he done on that cross, and I come up short of his examples. He left on this earth a lot of times, but uh, I truly, truly believe if I die before I get back home this afternoon that I'll be in heaven strictly because of him. He's good. Mm -hmm. And the more we realize that it's about Jesus and the less... We think about ourselves and our, all our stuff, all the churchianity. The more it's about Jesus, the better off we'll be. Randy, this has been so much fun. I've enjoyed it. Thanks for telling Braxton's story again, because I know a lot of people at our church know that story, but I want I wanted other people to hear that story. And I love the way you tell it honestly. Uh, you didn't make it where faith made this easy or fun. And, you know, Israel, Jacob was the guy who wrestled with God. Mm. And I, I've seen you wrestle and some moments it goes easier than others, but you have been faithful and I'm so grateful to call you a friend. I appreciate that. I never thought I'd never thought in my life I'd have a friend as a preacher. <laughs> I've told people I used to say I never thought I'd have a a friend, a preacher that become my friend. And now I tell them I've got a friend that happens to preach at the <laughs> church where we go. I love so. it. Randy, thank you for your time. And, thank you. Uh, friends, thank you so much for listening today. And I just, I want to encourage you to, to, to hear what Randy said and just look for, look for joy in those places and, and don't, don't give up too soon. Uh, you know where to find these episodes. You're listening to this one now. So uh, these episodes are on Apple Podcasts and Google Podcasts and the Amazon thing and Spotify. Uh, you know where they are, but it helps us a ton. Um, if you share the word, if you uh, leave us a rating or a review or any of that stuff, uh, thanks for doing that. Thanks for your time. And until next time, I can't wait to hear what God writes in your story. Thanks for listening to Rough Drafts. Be sure to subscribe so you don't miss a single episode. While you're at it, help us spread the word by leaving a rating and review. Until next time, let's keep looking for how God writes his love into our stories.